Hi, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be having this session with all of you. So welcome to the space where we're going to be discussing whether investing in female entrepreneurs is actually a social issue or an economic opportunity. And we truly believe that this is something that we really need to discuss because when we're talking about SDG number five, that is all about gender equality, many tend to think that when it comes to investments, it's just a nice thing, nice thing to do. And what we truly believe is that even though many of these targets, they are related to social justice, um, today we really want to highlight that it is actually a good idea and good business to embrace diversity, invest in women-led businesses, embrace a new way of thinking in general. And that's why we brought to you a very diverse set of women who are deeply engaged in the topic and they're going to be sharing their experiences, opinions, really from various like perspectives. We were just like talking, I think we're covering such a wide spectrum of the globe here. So we have Kimberly all the way from Australia. So it's 1 a.m. for her. Uh, Art is in India. Uh, India is in Africa. I'm here in Berlin. Uh, Germany and coming from Brazil originally. So it is quite a diverse group. And actually thanks to the BMW Foundation and the Responsible Leaders Network that we all know each other and we came together for this panel. So we really hope that after this conversation, it becomes a bit more clear that really supporting gender equality and balance in business, leadership, investments, government is really like the clever thing to do to really build a healthier and more successful world. And I would say that it's both from a wealth and well-being point of view. So before we go into introductions, a little bit of housekeeping, um, we're going to have around like 40 minutes of discussion and then open up for 10, 15 minutes of Q&A. So be ready and feel free to jump in or use the chat. I have to just see how is it that this is going to really work out. Um, sometimes I know that it's possible to jump with video and voice. Let's see how this plays out here. And the session, as I mentioned, is supported by the BMW Foundation through the Responsible Leaders Network, to which all of us belong, and also the Gender Alliance. It's a network of gender activists from the Responsible Leaders Network and other networks that are really like looking for the topic of gender in a different like, sectors and dimensions and also Ella Impact, which is a global female network focused on impact investing. So let me see, we have now around like 37 people joining us. So that's very exciting. And I would like to go quickly through the four of us. So Andia is joining us from Africa. So she's a gender lens investing expert and she's the investment director at uh, Grassa Mashal Trust where she's driving the organization's Gender Lens Investing Initiative and is leading the team to create a Pan-African Women's Investment Fund. Super exciting. And she's been a key person in East Africa to give women more space in the fund management industry and is the founding chairperson of New Faces, New Voices, uh, the Kenya chapter, which is a women finance network. We also have Arti. Arti is the co-founder of UNU Social Business in India. I think that UNU's... Uh, dismisses any further introductions but there she was like catalyzing the creation of the impact investing funds and also the indian corporate action tank which was india's first incubator for large companies to do in-house social business innovation and is currently head of future thinking to really accelerate social business creation around the world and her work focuses on building an, an enabling ecosystem for large corporates to transform into purpose-driven companies so welcome, very excited to have you here. Uh, we also have Kimberly. So Kimberly is yeah, going through the night to be here with us today or this evening. So she's logging in from Australia and she's the founder of Global Women's Leaders Strategic Philanthropy and the chair of the Center for Global Equality at Cambridge. So she has a career in banking and financial, and financial services. She was CFO for retail, a business and private banking divisions of Westpac Banking Corporation and has worked extensively in the international capital markets with Citigroup. Uh, she is a strategic philanthropist, which I find is a super interesting approach, and she's coordinating global women leaders. And this is a community of women who collectively leverage their professional expertise, experience, and global connections for maximum humanitarian development impact. And as she's also involved with the Center for Global Equality, as I mentioned in Cambridge, and that is contributing to the UN Sustainable Development Goals at large through an inclusive innovation approach. 
And as for me, uh, you're part of host tonight. Uh, I'm Julia, I'm originally from Brazil, but I've been living in Berlin for the past three and a half years. I'm the founder of Ella Impact and co-founder of Conscious Growth, which we are actually like rebranding to Reimagine. And it's gonna be the first B2B bank here in Germany or Europe focused on mainstream impact here in Europe. I started my career in banking and I got really into the tech and private equity world before getting into the social impact ecosystem. So some highlights uh, were also like my time working with Unisocial Business in Brazil. So that's how I got to know Arte at, at first and also being a partner at Vox Capital, which was the first venture capital fund doing impact in Brazil. So now off to our panel and our super exciting uh, discussions. And to start with, I would like to ask you three, why is it actually a good business to invest in women? Arti, maybe you want to start with that. Sure. Um, so um, the you know the the definition of gender lens investing uh, today it encompasses um, various perspectives. One is investing in women-led businesses. The second is investing with the lens of including women in value chains, um, and then the third is including women in investing decisions as well. So, you know, you said that um, Yunus really needs no introduction and he doesn't because of, you know, Grameen Bank. Now, I think Grameen Bank is one of the earliest examples of gender lens investing that really encompasses all three perspectives. And it's also a beautiful example of um, the business case for investing in women. Um, so Grameen Bank was, you know, it was set up. Uh, first of all, as a female-focused lending in, uh, business that invests primarily in women-led businesses and also where the decision-making is in the hands of the uh, female borrowers. Um, and the story of Grameen Bank really, uh, you know, continues to focus rightly on its poverty-alleviating impact, uh, the fact that, you know, it's brought 9 million borrowers um, out of uh, abject poverty, it's uh, and and you know at, at it's been replicated around the world and impacted about a hundred million people globally through those replications. But what isn't talked about so much is how successful Grameen Bank is as a business on traditional business parameters. Um, it's the scale of how many customers it serves. It serves nine million uh, customers in Bangladesh. It's disbursed twenty-four billion dollars to the world's poorest women. And it has a 98% repayment rate, which is, uh, you know, higher than that of, of um, the, the risk-free bank, uh, the less risky banking sector in a sense. So the business case that it demonstrates is twofold. One, that by investing in women, you create economic value, which is evidenced by the number of people that it's brought out of poverty. And the second, that investing in women as a business is also good business. Um, and this is not just a developing country experience. There is, a, you know, it's a there's a Grameen America as well, um, which provides micro loans to women below the federal poverty line, and it's had incredible impact in the 12 years that it's been operating. It's disbursed um, one of almost one and a half billion dollars in loans to about 125,000 women in 15 cities across the U.S. And these women, in turn, have gone on to create about 100, uh, 150,000 jobs. Um, they've achieved higher family incomes. They've, they've revitalized their communities. And again, social impact apart or economic impact um, uh, apart, Grameen America is also successful parameters. And these women have also repaid their loans with, again, a 99% repayment rate. So. Um, I think this this demonstrates that there is um, that it's that the the, the that it, there is a very strong business case for the social opportunity, which is investing in women. Um, I, there is also um, you know the now if you come to the untapped opportunity and you you take the example of India, um, McKinsey re research suggests that India could add over seven hundred and seventy billion dollars to its GDP. Um, by ensuring equal opportunities for women. India currently has one of the lowest female particip uh, participation rates in the workforce. Of the, we add 1 million young people to the workforce every year, and only 13% of those are women. And in fact, their participation has declined sharply over the last 10 years. Even at the top of the pyramid, we have a mere 14% of women in leadership positions, 
and only 12% of the funded startups in India have um, a female co-founder. And the reason that I'm um, talking about these numbers is because obviously the flip side of this of of these problems is um, is the business opportunity as evidenced by coming back. So provides a little bit of perspective from our network. Great, great. It, it, it's very interesting to hear like the, the also the, the setting right now in India, right? And India, I think you can bring also a very interesting perspective from Africa and what's actually like your take on the soul, like why is it good to invest in women? Um, uh, thanks, Julia and Artie. Um, gender lens investing really can play a significant role in addressing the challenges women have as consumers, um, employees, entrepreneurs, and this is mainly about uh, a lack of access to finance, uh, social biases, um, inequality in opportunities. So we've seen more than uh, 4.6 billion in debt and capital being deployed as a gender lens across the world in the last five years. But a lot of the activity has remained confined to North America with only 6% of it being deployed um, in Africa. It must also be noted that Africa is the only continent where women entrepreneurs, when you look at the MasterCard index of women entrepreneurs, the, the only continent where women have chosen to be entrepreneurs more than their male counterparts. And having countries like Ghana and Uganda top other uh, more developed countries, so despite the harsher socioeconomic conditions, uh, women are still prevailing on a choosing entrepreneurship. Um, most entrepreneurs in Africa really cite the lack of access to finance and access to markets as key impediments to, to growth. And the lack of finance probably accounts for twice the proportion of business failure amongst women compared with men. Um, a lot of it has got to do with the smaller asset ownership that really leads to women's struggle um, to get loans of the same size um, as men. These are things that really fuel the capital investment gap. Um, we've also seen that as much as women uh, are, are running businesses, most of their businesses are on average smaller and less productive than male-owned businesses. Although there is a case that there, there, there is a difference between doing B2B or B2C businesses in terms of the, the type of businesses women entrepreneurs are in, we found that women entrepreneurs also lack mentors because they aren't able to see people that are like them to succeed in this field. Uh, when we did our research, we found about 63% of women entrepreneurs not having access to a business or industry mentor, and more male entrepreneurs really knowing a man who has started and run a business successfully than women do. Um, and uh, this is despite the fact that, you know, evidence really looks at really the opportunity and the product customization of the female segment, really looking at women as consumers, not only controlling consumer spending, but really serving an underserved market because they understand the needs. And when we do our investing, we are finding really interesting women entrepreneurs. I think half of our pool, at least 50% of the women entrepreneurs, have products and services that cater to the underserved female segment. We're talking about issues to do with maternity, biodegradable sanitary towels, baby products, advice to moms, wholesale online shopping, early childhood education, skin hair products, hair care, all of these really thoughtful solutions that wouldn't necessarily come up if you're dealing with a male entrepreneur. So they are problems that need to be solved in this world and can be solved in this world um, if we're dealing with women entrepreneurs. Um, I'd awesome. also like to say that um, I, 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 I women tend to hire more women, really having between 50 workforce as women, while men only have a third. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. It's super insightful. And it's interesting to understand as well that potentially there are like really like differences like across geographies and also like types of businesses. So like hearing that potential like in Africa, you see sometimes that like um, some business might be like less efficient because of lack of really like resources and benchmarks, et cetera. There's like some data that indicates like venture back companies in the US and Europe in general, they have like 35% return over investments when compared to men or even like 12% above like revenues as well. So I think it's an important like a piece to really highlight that like women can be really more efficient if they're given like the same kind of like conditions that men have. 
And Kimberly, I think you have like a slight um, different approach and angle to, to this topic. I would like to hear your thoughts on that as well. Yes, so my background is actually in structured finance and banking. And in that, I would describe that role as really a pipeline creator, you know, creating new structures, creating deals, creating access to finance, creating access to markets. And when I listen to Artie and Andia, it's, you know, it's I'm completely convinced as we all are that it's good business. It makes good sense. There are great businesses out there. So why aren't we doing more of this? And I hear this over and over again. It's, you know, the access to finance isn't because finance isn't out there. It's because we often leave women on their own to try to navigate this this space while they're trying to run their business. So we need to make it easier for them to access finance, to access mentors, to access markets. And one of the things that people overlook is you need to invest in actually the pipeline builders or the glue or the connective tissue that brings this together. So in a commercial banking background, we always had enough resources, Slack and my team to be working on new deals, coming up with new structures and the sort of, you know, the, the Slack and the banking system paid for that. Now, who pays for the pipeline builders in this system? There are There is a gap here for women actually to take the initiative as female philanthropists, as female investors in pipeline creators to help bring these products and these women to a point where they are investable. We can't leave them on their own. And as women, it's our responsibility, I think, to step in and, and create structures that do that. And I would, I would give the example of the Center for Global Equality at Cambridge, which is run by Dr. Laura Allen, a woman investing in Dr. Lara and her team to, it's a drop in the bucket actually, the leverage effect of investing in groups like that who incubate, cultivate these ventures, female founders doing amazing social work, you know, groundbreaking vaccine carrier technology that will transform childhood pneumonia, let alone COVID um, sort of vaccine delivery. But we're not investing in those pipeline builders, those networks that are going to see these women actually supported so that we can invest in them. So we need to create the pipeline and the products so that we can help That's them. That's a great point, Kimberly, because I think that many times when we're talking about investments, people think tend to think about like a certain stage of development of a company. And here it's so important that we understand that there are like different stages of development and we need different sources of capital for each one of these. So like having said that, I think it's a good segue into like our second like main question of this conversation, which is what are the current perspectives of the different kind of investor profiles on gender lens? So like covering these different stages and maybe I will invert here the order now and talk about like the beginning of the pipeline creation with, with Kimberly. What's your take on that? Well, I think it's just a continuation yeah. of what I was just saying. So the, the the Global Women Leaders community that I convene comes from my own personal journey of trying to take what I learned in banking and finance, the global connections that I built, and somehow give back in the initially the philanthropic space. And as my own personal journey has evolved, that's turned into impact investing, you know, rising women entrepreneurship, and I realized that the, the power of convening other women like me around the world to think about how they can help, you know, we've had pro bono legal work for decades. Well, what else can we donate? A bit of our time, whether for me, I do this full time, for others, a bit of your time to contribute as many do as a mentor. But beyond that, you know, we work on financing structures, we work on uh, different ways to think about new pipelines and pathways to get capital, um, you know, to female entrepreneurs and work with other institutions and draw them together as that connective tissue. Again, women are pretty good at sort of seeing the possibility of how to bring people together and build community. And I think that's a real opportunity here and a, a catalytic role that female philanthropists and investors in pipelines can actually kickstart so we can do this faster and at greater scale than, we're, than we've been able to do today. Yeah, and I think in that point, it's very interesting to see also that like women are gonna be the largest like inheritors in the coming decades of like capital. So what is it that these yeah, these people are going to be really like doing with this, all this capital to really like foster more like gender uh, equality at the beginning of the pipeline going forward, right? So, so Andia, what's your perspective on the gender lens across, you know, like fund managers, family offices, banks? Um, yeah, so um, if I touch on banks, um, 
Uh, basically, in emerging economies, women are about one fifth less likely than men to have an account uh, with a financial institution. Um, and globally, they sort of represent sort of 56% of the financially excluded. Um, I do want to say before I jump into banks that there has been a lot of a female participation when it comes to the digital loans. But that in itself, uh, when we talk about digital lending, has its own um, has its own limitations because the credit offered is really expensive if you try and extend it beyond a month. It really works well for daily traders. Um, when we look at just uh, women um, in banking, it's really funny because uh, women are celebrated to be very good savers. Uh, but when it actually comes to the share of the aggregate credit portfolios considered, you'll find that uh, they make up only 18% of these credit put, uh, portfolios. And when we talk about the loan approval rates, they're 20% lower than men. Loan sizes are 58% smaller. So there is an issue with the banking um, industry. Now, this is something that the banking industry um, has uh, realized or is beginning to realize. And uh, we have started tackling it by really engaging in the composition of the women within uh, that industry itself. And when we did our inaugural study, which was the Eclipse study on gender equality and diversity in the workplace, um, and we had five of the top 10 institutions come from the financial sector. And we're seeing that some of these decision making and having women in those strong, should I say, line roles, not the staff roles, have really uh, promoted the banks be more conscious and more deliberate about bringing women entrepreneurs into that fold. Um, when we look at the fund managers industry, um, I think this is an industry that is really needs quite a lot of work, but is coming up with a lot of uh, innovative things because the, the few women that are there are speaking out. We're looking at only 8% of women that are senior investment professionals. And why do we care about this? Because these are the capital allocation decisions. This is where some of the biases lie. So it's really important in terms of how these teams are constructed. Um, and it's, it's, it's almost shocking to find that nearly, in a study that IFC did, nearly 70% of senior investment teams are all male. And it's been proved time and time again that there is unconscious bias. And this is bias that we have been raised in. So there's a certain perception in how we deal or view with uh, a woman with children vis-a-vis -a, -vis a man with children. You know, there's so what, a what different question views in how we view a single woman. And these are things that we want to unlock. And how do we want to unlock it? We're really advocating for very pure and specific gender lens funds. We have found that when women are actually brought together and it's very deliberate that you are searching for returns um, at a pre-investment level all across the investment process to the end, uh, women come. The deal sourcing is a little bit different when you're getting the way you would actually review uh, the portfolio. You still get the returns. It's not about the returns. I think evidence has shown the gender balance teams uh, produce higher returns. The issue is getting more women invested and also encouraging the follow-on investment. So one question, and here like connecting the two of you, I think we all agree like gender lens is actually needed. And how much would you say that both in the like within the philanthropic world and within like fund management and banks, do people actually stipulate like KPI? So really like metrics to follow whether really like the gender approach has been uh, improving, increasing and respected throughout like everything that they have been doing. Do you see these KPIs actually be implemented? Or is it more like a pink washing? I think you're on mute, Kimberly. I'm I'm not familiar with what the banks are doing on inside lending. I'm no longer working inside a, a, a large bank. But I, what I can say is that as there are disruptive models where people are taking great things from the philanthropic world and applying them to um, this uh, funding of female entrepreneurs. So CEO is a great example of a, a hybrid model where it's not philanthropy. It's a straight loan, it's sort of a revolving grant where women pool their um, sort of catalytic capital together. They choose, um, you know, uh, female-led ventures to support. 
They also support them through networks, community, et cetera. It's a fabulous model, very scalable. It appeals to women who like to participate and learn about what they're investing in or learn what they're giving in. And it's a great hybrid model. So there's disruption going on in terms of you don't need to rely directly on the banks to um, intermediate between women helping women or anyone helping women in this case get started. So there's great things in the world of connectivity um, that we can do to actually move capital more directly to women and support them along the way. Awesome. And Dia, is your sound working again? Can you hear us? You're on mute, so. Hi, Julia. I'm just having a Hi. technical issue. I'll be back. Okay. I can't. Okay, so let's see how this goes, but. I think that one of the things that we have been like discussing a lot is like the um, the intentionality behind like gender lens, right? I think it, for many people, it has become a trend. It's important to say that you consider like gender diversity in your portfolios, but like most of the times we don't see KPIs, we don't see commitment. We just see, you know, a few lines here and there and some photos that, oh yeah, we do have like women in the portfolio or we are like really considering like hiring more women in the team and really like, um, making them part of management teams, et cetera. But in reality, we are like very far from like the decision-making positions, which also affects another uh, angle of the conversation. And here I would like Artie to to jump in when it comes to discussing it. Is it only about like the gender lens into what it is that we're investing? Or is it also like a way of thinking how we do business, how we do investments? Exactly. Um, exactly. Arti, we, we, we. Sorry, you're breaking. And um, so what? Bring in uh, an additional perspective uh, to the ones that Andy and Kimberly brought in uh, by. Yeah, you're back. Are you able to hear me? Yes. I'm back. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, great. So I was saying that I, I'd like to, I'd like to bring in a different, uh, an additional perspective from the ones that uh, Andy and Kimberly brought in by co-opting the whole, um, uh, reimagining capitalism discussion into the idea of say, um, the topic that we're discussing today um, by expanding the scope of gender lens investing into what I'm going to call right now feminine investing. Now, what does that mean? Um, I'd argue that the kind of rapacious capitalism we're seeing today, uh, the climate exploitation, the um, inequality that we're seeing today, the exploitation, the political aggression, even you know our desire to go and colonize the moon or colonize Mars, all of this that we're seeing in the world today is you know a result of too much masculinity, uh, too much masculine thinking. Let me put it that way: aggression, linear thinking, focus on growth for the sake of growth alone. And one could argue that we've lost touch as a global society with the principles of the feminine. And what does that mean? It means the principles of rootedness, of circular thinking, of sustainability, of community and inclusion. So to bring the world into balance, so really to stop the world from self-detonating, we need to reconnect in a sense with the feminine. And masculine and feminine principles are independent of gender because the feminine does not sit in a female body alone. Neither does the masculine sit in a male body alone. So while, yes, it's important to invest in women, invest for women and invest by women, um, we also need to, we, we can't continue to invest in women who are doing all things in the old ways. We need to carve out space to invest in men and women who are thinking about doing business differently. Um, and so this is where I'm sort of co-opting these recent calls that we're seeing to reimagine capitalism. And I'd particularly like to talk about this from the perspective of bringing purpose into large companies and the rise of ESG investing, really, or purpose investing as evidence of the feminine making its way back into capitalism. And if you were to put some numbers behind this, um, the global impact investing market is about $750 billion dollars. 
Of this, about $5 billion is gender lens investing. I hope my statistics are right. Um, and yes, we should carve out more of this pie into gender investing and increase the size of the impact investing pie in general. But another way of creating me meaningful impact is to look at the trillions of dollars that are currently invested in traditional financial markets in large companies and co-opt that money into feminine investing instead of one swoop by changing the color of this money, by changing the way that this money thinks about its purpose. So really feminine capitalism in a sense. And in addition to the moral argument, like going back to the first question we were discussing, is there a business case? So I would say that in addition to the moral argument for feminine capitalism, there is also a business case for feminine capitalism. And here I want to reference some research that we did last year um, together with Porticus, INSEAD and the Schwab Foundation, where we found that companies that engage and uh, encourage purpose-led business projects, they did better on core business parameters as well. Traditional business parameters, they had better employee engagement, they had improved customer perception, leading to a top and bottom line impact, they had improved brand perception, um, they had more innovation, their employees had more entrepreneurial skills. So feminine capitalism, apart from being one possible solution awesome. to, and, and I think you know, it's are so really needed right now as we're facing this crisis that doesn't allow us to be in person right now <laughs> at SOCAP that everything is culminating is really like asking us to really like question the status quo and one of the additional challenges that we see is that whenever we face crisis many times we have either the uh, opportunity of really stepping to the new and going for really like innovative solutions or we can fall back into the comfortable and known and really just embrace the old old paradigms and this is something that i have been like raising the question around like since the beginning of COVID. and actually there's like now data supporting us that we're going backwards when it comes to gender lens so the there's like a late i think it was one or two weeks ago that pitch book released the data saying that uh venture-backed women actually reached their like bottom compared to like the last three years so it's like the least investment into women-led businesses since three years ago and mainly because companies portfolio managers in general just like putting money exactly where money was before just supporting existing portfolios not looking at new opportunities looking at the new uh, innovation so i would like to invite you and here andy i think you can like contribute a bit more also on what is the impact that COVID has had in fundraising for women-led businesses across the globe. Thank you so much, Julia, and I'm sorry I had to leave and, and go out again. Um, COVID has really uh, taken us back and it's taken a lot of, a lot of people back and, it, and it's really different. You know, the other day I was talking to a woman entrepreneur and, we're, and she was talking about the impact of, of working from home and she said when she was at home alone she was quite happy to have a sandwich but when with her husband home they have to cook it's like a full-blown and it's like it, it's her her husband and they've got a daughter and a son and guess who are the two people cooking for the husband and the son her and the daughter and she's also doing online learning i think these are the things that we have to see that that happened with covid very um, very interesting things. Women uh, in business have been notorious for using their savings to grow their business, have always sort of used their amount and been very cautious, never borrowing more than they need. And we got to a point that when you looked at COVID, and, and, and especially if you're somebody that was relying on foot traffic or future events, we're looking at businesses that don't have more than three months runway. They practically can't exist. So, I mean, the, the, the call is really that we had, we were making a lot of progress. This was actually the year of the women. When we're looking at Beijing 25, we were expecting some of the biggest commitments to come through to women. And now governments are reprioritizing budgets. And it was very, almost disappointing to see very quickly how even the decisions when those COVID response funds were coming, suddenly we were being addressed by mail, all we did when we opened and uh, looked at the TV, uh, the radio, it was suddenly a very dominant sign of male leadership. 
And I'm so glad that, you know, the press was coming out and digging stories of what women are doing and really pushing for that gendered approach. Um, so what we have here is that it's become a really uh, difficult scenario when it comes to fundraising. Um, I think uh, from the industry, as you said, rightly said, Julia, it's a wait and see, and it's let's protect our portfolio. Let's protect the value that we already have. And when people are looking at um, when people are looking at new investments, it's going to be in what they consider the the sexy fields. They want to see what's happening on the tech side. They want to see what's happening uh, on the energy side. So if you're the traditional sort of mom and uh, pop shop that is feeding and really important from a neighborhood community point of view, it's not really seen as an investor priority. And what we're saying is when we have extraordinary circumstances, we cannot really look and, and view investments in the same way. I'm really happy that institutions like MasterCard and Opus are really doing what we call COVID rebuild loans. So they're mm. really looking at how do we stabilize the businesses before? How do we keep the lights on? Then from those businesses, we can pick and see which businesses do we actually want to support with venture investments. That's awesome. What's your take on that, Kimberly? I think you have also like some interesting inputs on that. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a flip side. I mean, from a personal perspective, I would normally have to do a lot of travel to do business, to be in places, uh, to sort of make these connections and work on these things. And now it's a real leveler. Um, you know, I have five children and a husband and, you know, I live in Australia. So for me, getting up at 1 a.m. and participating in a call like this, I can get it done with a late night and not be gone for two weeks. So there are the flip side of the coin is that in terms of collaborating, um, accelerating access to networks, thinking of new ways of working together, it's, you know, there are more people probably watching this SOCAP session from different parts of the world than we would have in person. Um, so as women, we are balancing these different priorities as are men. I don't want to exclude men actually from this conversation. There are some, you know, fabulous men in our in our network that um you know it's not exclusive to women actually so we need to find new ways of doing this it has diverted capital for sure at least in the short term i mean covid is a priority for a lot of catalytic philanthropists for a lot of investors for you know valid reasons um but we need to make sure again that what structures are I'm, we I'm building underneath? Again. You know, what i have to jump in and out my apologies what, okay and yeah what what future do we do we imagine for ourselves? What um, new models of of uh, you know capital going more directly can we stitch up during this time? So let's not waste this opportunity, as I think one of the other uh, speakers said. You know, uh, there is an old model that was built a certain way, um, VC model going and pitching all this sort of thing. You know, let's let's build some pools of capital that can carry women through this and that can come from women. I mean, you're getting zero interest in the bank, at least in my country at the moment. So, you know, putting some money in the hands of a woman led business to get them through. Um, and if at the worst, it turns out a donation at the best, you've really helped someone. So there's, let's think about new ways yeah. of doing this. And I think Arti, you have some also interesting insights uh, because you guys were coordinating a COVID alliance. So what are like some of the specific components that you can share with us? Sure. Uh, I mean, I, at first I'd, I'd just like to echo um, what Kimberly and Andy are saying um, and maybe just bring in the BOP perspective uh, from India. Um, you know, women have, COVID has impacted women disproportionately in India. Um, first, from an employment perspective, 80% of women workers in India are employed in the informal sector. Um, and, you know, we've seen these images of, of migrant workers. Uh, it, it's been a very hot uh, topic in India. We've seen horrible images of, you know, because of the lockdown, uh, migrant workers from cities uh, traveling back to their villages on, on, on foot. Um, you know, this this is this is the the, the large um, uh there's very little data on on this entire um you know a large proportion of the workforce that we have in india and uh and you know and, and there are an 80 percent of like i said the women in india are employed in this workforce um 
so the current crisis has uh, very severely impacted their ability to continue working, to earn any income, and obviously it's then impacted even more those who are particularly vulnerable, such as uh, you know single, um, differently abled women, or those um, you know that um, come from uh, um, from from marginalized sections of, of society. Um, you know, um, government support uh, has, uh, you know, has not been enough. Um, and some of it uh, is has been in the form of guaranteed work. Uh, but then again, that is also manual labor, uh, like, for example, digging of wells or building of roads, which is unsuited um, in, in some ways for women. Um, school has been disrupted. Um, this is disproportionately, again, impacted women. We already have a very high dropout rate in India. 40% um, of adolescent girls between the age of 15 uh, to 18 drop out of school. This is pre-COVID. This is going to soar as families uh, prioritize the education of boys. Access to healthcare has been disrupted. So there is, there is a need to lean into investing into women or into structures that, that enable um, women. Um, and yes, uh, we, we have uh, come together with uh, a bunch of impact investors and the World Economic Forum to launch uh, an alliance to raise money for social businesses. And, um, and of course, uh, you know, it, it, is, it has been challenging, but we have managed to create um, emergency funding for, uh, for a lot of the um, social businesses. Super interesting. Yeah. So it is a, a moment for us to all be having our radars really on to to not let this, you know, like moment take us back in time. And I think that one of the things that we all really appreciate and consider as important for like this movement going forward for women is also the power of networks. So we are connected here through a network of the responsible leaders, um, but we also have our own other networks that somehow connect as well. And in that, I would like to invite you both, like India and Kimberly, to talk a little bit as like about like the work you have been doing with your own networks as well, and how you see that they have been also like driving women forward. Before we go into like some Q and A, India, you want to go first? You're on mute, India. Please. Um, the network has really changed my life, and I'm, I feel so privileged to be part of the BMW Foundation, which I think of my uh, as an international network that really has like-minded individuals with social impact. But being a woman in finance, I've had to really stick with other women within finance. I've been in senior positions before where you're sort of the only woman on a table, and you find that when you have a network of people in your professional field, you feel more confident and you get a lot of peer support and you're able to confide in without feeling judged. So I feel from a professional career point of view, having a safe space to discuss um, even sensitive issues like sexual harassment, which a lot of women face when they're fundraising, that can happen within a peer networks. Also, mm -hmm. the ability to advocate and sponsor for one another. We are very, um, we are watchers when it comes to Manals. When we see a manal and we see uh, places that women could be with speaking, we put ourselves out there. I would also like to say that um, I've been very uh, happy with the entrepreneurial networks we've also uh, been a part of. This is where we do our deal sourcing. This is where we build trust. You can you can have a fund. You can be fully funded. You could have twenty million, thirty million, fifty million dollars. Join a woman network and nobody will, will want to be invested in you. People have got to know you, highly relational, highly trust. And what those networks do is that they keep me close to the pulse of what women's, women are experiencing, both, both the good stuff um, and the bad stuff. And that's why I really believe in investing in women. It goes beyond just that. It's experiencing them through all of the, the particular networks. And then it's the network I run, which is the Women in Finance, uh, Kenya that really goes uh, beyond investing, but also has the bankers and the insurance providers. And sometimes to create a solution with a big problem like this, you need collaboration between financial services providers and technical assistance partners. What, what about you, Kimberly? <laughs> 
the same experience i'll just follow on that from my own perspective when i was a banker there were not enough women to even have a network so i think it's fantastic that there are such uh, networks now but i also want to say my other experience in the philanthropic world is i moved from having a all philanthropic network to realizing that actually having a network that involved or a community really i'd prefer to call it of women from ngos banking government you know uh, people who are actually on the ground doing the work in humanitarian organizations. It's actually a much stronger network. We learn from each other. We share different stories. We find ways to co-design solutions much better than siloed networks. So there are places for, of course, you know, women in finance, there's a women in social finance network. That's great. There's a great network, um, womenpreneur that works in Belgium and the Middle East that's doing great things to, to support social entrepreneurs that are women. But those cross networks, I think, are actually what we need more of and opportunities like this to sit in conversation with all of you. And that's one thing the BMW uh, Responsible Leadership Network has done for me is give me the opportunity to meet people from completely different geographies, different industries, and we've come up with different ways of supporting each other. So more of the same, including men, um, is, is I guess, the secret. And, you know, the more we can do that and invest in actually creating those networks, uh, which is what BMW has done, I encourage other philanthropists and sort of pipeline funders, again, that I would call them to, to really think about how that can be the first investment you make, because all the other investments will actually dovetail out of those joined up people working together. Yeah. And I think just like to compliment here with Ella Impact, it's been a lot about like, like learning with each other and like cross pollinating different like regions, because sometimes you have different ex expectations and different experiences with like investors, like peers, et cetera. And just seeing, okay, what is it that you're doing in the US or Latin America and Europe, also, like Australia and in Africa. And we see that we can really expand the innovative approach that we have and just supporting and like amplifying pipeline for investment, amplifying recommendations of investors. So I think networks at the end of the day are like still a very important secret sauce of success for entrepreneurs, investors, and all of us like trying to change the world for a better place. And we strongly encourage, yeah, go ahead, Kimberly. Yeah, and one, one thing I wanted to say as well, we've talked a lot about finance today, tonight, and often, even when the finance is there, I have a good example from a, an entrepreneur in, in my network, um, Sep Jordan, which is a social enterprise working with refugee women um, doing embroidered, high-end embroidered products. When I first met Roberta, I said, what do you need? I'm a banker. She said, I'm a banker, mm -hmm. but what I need is access markets i need network to figure out how to get these products i need to move these products i need to get them into stores so the more sales we have the more women i can hire and the more this is successful it's not always finance and access to markets is a big one logistics supply chains networks again so it's a it's a it's a whole other conversation but um that's a great example of a really wonderful model but it the only way it's going to scale is access to markets through networks yeah definitely Awesome. I think it's been such a valuable discussion so far. I wanted to allow the people who are following us, I think around like 55. So good 55 people throughout the whole panel. That's very exciting. Uh, please write your questions here on the chat. I don't I don't know if there's like an option that you could potentially like pop into the, the screen as well. So I think we have like one first question coming from Berta. I don't know. India, can you hear us again? Are you are you back somehow? Um, unfortunately, I can't really hear you bits and pieces, but I can I can manage. I can look at the chat. OK, so I think the first question was like targeting you, like about your experience in the space of like banking fund management uh, as a woman of color. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's um. I think it's interesting that the color aspect is is coming up now. You know, being in Africa, you're you're really fighting the gender aspect. And I was leading an investment team of all males when I was thirty, so I was fighting ageism as well. Um, I really started feeling the 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 color aspect when I when I started dealing with international investors. Um, and what I realized is that there are not that many women out there directly fundraising 
for champions. Um, I was here saying the woman entrepreneur, the African woman is bankable. Uh, your next, you know, uh, 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 your next Zuckerberg or Oprah is in Africa. Come find them. And there were certain people, it was a bias about maybe the African continent, what Africa itself can deliver, and who is giving the message. And I think sometimes we have become so used to um, only accepting people when they say things when they've been married to your woman who has been married to a politician or you're from some sort of a royal family. I, I found it, it was really difficult to get um, a technical argument across, but I was lucky to get the support of the Grasha Michelle Foundation, the trust, uh, Mrs. Michelle, who has that political stature, um, she said it, and then she opened the door for me to continue saying it. Um, so I think having very diverse faces and having different women of color speak to investors around the globe is really important so people um, just sort of take away the unconscious bias about what an investor looks like or who an investor is. Awesome. And there was like a very interesting question here, and I think I would like direct that to like RT from Rosalie asking us, how can women be taken seriously when we champion a compassionate economy? So the whole like feminine lens of like doing business. So <laughs> how can we be taken seriously? Um, so, I mean, that that's an interesting question. So I, I, I maybe I'm bringing two angles here. One is, who do we want to be taken seriously by? Um, I think that so often as women, we um, we have we have or, or or let's say if you as women or as let's let's say people that embody the feminine perspective, we so often um, we so often try to fit into or uh, sort of. We're, we're trying to be taken seriously by people whose perspectives are very, very different from us. And so we sort of almost put that perspective on a pedestal and ours a little bit lower. Um, and, and then we feel incomplete or somehow um, we feel that we, we need to, we feel that somehow that ours is um, not, not equally deserving of, um, of being, our, ours is not equally valid in a sense. So I think one is we need to change our perspective of um, what being taken seriously means. Um, we, we need to start taking ourselves seriously and really start believing in what it is that we do. I think that's one. And then the second is when you are trying to convince people who think very differently, I think the first step is, is to listen. Um, and, I, and I think, um, again, that's, that's something that right now the world, you know, we, we just, we've forgotten how to listen. Um, and, and then this is a gender independent thing. And then finally, um, uh, a, a more banal, uh, sort of, um, uh, point of view would, would also be, um, that if you're trying to convince those who, um, who are still sort of thinking in the old ways, there are, you know, some of the arguments that we've been making earlier in the panel around, around the business case, business case being defined in the old way uh, of um, of sort of moving into this new way of thinking also. Um, so I don't know, I, I, hope, I hope that answers uh, the question at least. It's a difficult one. I think I can just echo that. I believe you, Kimberly, and India as well, right? So it's just like, who is it that we're trying to please? And what kind of like... Well, and what... What's the definition of a compassionate economy? I mean, you know, we're all here for humankind, you know, the economy that that is here to lift us all up and, and have good quality of life. I mean, is that compassion or is that humanity or is that it's it's, it's just it yeah. is what, it, you know, <laughs> it is what it should be. I don't think compassion should be a word that should be put in any kind of negative light. I think that's I would be proud to be considered um you know, I think I should be taken seriously if I'm focusing on a compassionate economy. Actually, I donate my entire time to this as a strategic philanthropist. So absolutely proud to. And I my think time, this is all about uh, actually like the impact lenses, right? So if you're talking about like considering other stakeholders, that is compassionate, like at the core, 
right? So all of, all of us impact investors should be actually considering ourselves as compassionate investors in a sense, right? That it's much more than just like looking at the bottom line and profits at the end of the day, right? So uh, this is actually a, a great question. Uh, so we have a few more. I'm just like looking at the time here. Um, I think, let me see how to manage that. I, I think like Takuro Kimura actually had a, a good point about how can we really build leadership and set a movement to actually make sure that we can deploy, you know, like $10 trillion in the coming years across different asset classes for the gender lenses investments at, at large, right? So he says, I know that this is a top-down approach, but I believe it to be one way of looking for a solution. Someone wants to, to give it a go? Sorry, can you repeat? Julia? So essentially like giving that we will have like around like $10 trillion uh, to deploy most likely for like G, G, GLI. So what is it that's gonna be required to actually make sure that we are managing this appropriately and really having, you know, this movement go, like going forward. So he is already suggesting like the answer which is around like leadership, right? So I think it's part of what we were like discussing about like having more women as well. Um, in investment teams and part of like decision making groups that really like, allow us to like bring this perspective to the table and like it's it's a top down approach many times but what are your thoughts there kimberly yeah i i think i hear this over and over again i i participated in uh, putting together a workshop last year which was uh, had women from global different globalities uh, working on what their issues were, what they needed. And over and over again, I think there's a question in the chat that says the same thing. Is there a list I can get that's vetted for funding and mentoring incubation resources? You know, we, we don't have it. We have to, again, I'm a structured finance banker. We have to do the work to put the infrastructure in place. You know, you it's not just going to appear. We cannot let these women-led businesses just try to navigate the entire global world of funding and investment and, and resources. You have to build this and even some of the great initiatives like the the wefi coming out of the world bank even that is a multilateral to multilateral tricking trickling down that is still not happen you know the bottom up approach or the intermediate approach you know we have the technology you know where is google where is where is facebook where is you know where are these tech providers and working with us to create the community links to get organized on this if we don't get organized we're going to be talking about this in 5 years and 10 years and people are going to be still scratching around. I mean, I'm I'm a former bank treasury employee. You know, we had people in treasury for a reason to go out and raise the money for the bank. You don't have the mortgage division raising money for the bank. You don't have the auto division raising money. The treasury raises the money. So we need to create the treasury for these women and men to go and be able to access these resources in a seamless manner so they can run their business. That's the last thing they need to do is stay up all night trying to figure out where to find an investor. You know, let's help bring yeah. it to them. Awesome. Yeah, I think being conscious of time here, I would like to thank all of you who have been like following our panel, RT, Kimberly, and yeah, for joining such an amazing, exciting discussion. I think our hearts are really in this topic and we are very happy that this panel was voted and we had the, the opportunity of sharing this with like many more people. And I think we have a lot of good materials to like inspire others. And I hope that these last words also inspire you uh, ladies and gentlemen who have been like listening to really like go after the structuring of these pillars necessary to drive the gender lens topic forward. So thank you very much and have a lovely day, afternoon, evening, whatever you are. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone thank you. for joining. Thank you, Julia, thank for you. organizing yeah. us. Thank you. And thank you, BMW. Moderator. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. And yeah, thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Good night. Good night. <laughs>